two notices. Uh, don't forget now. Pamper day. What day is pamper day? Thursday. Be there. We all need a pamper. What time do I need to turn up? I do, I do believe in miracles. Pamper day Thursday. Don't forget what's happening Friday? Drakeford. Where is it? Cost. Be there or be square? Be there. Okay. And bring people along because uh, Lucy Jane and, and Drake, they are an amazing couple. Okay. Anyone been seeing the football? No, don't like football? That's okay. That You're allowed to say that. Okay. Did, did the French do well yesterday? No. Oh. I want to tell you about a Frenchman this morning. Can I do this? There was a man called... What did she say? She... And that's lovely. Do you know what? Do you know what? I think, Nance, that you represent probably 75% of women. I'd rather the soaps. Yeah. We love honesty in the house of the Lord, don't we? I'd rather the soaps. Let me tell you about a Frenchman, Blondin. Ever heard of Blondin? Yes. Yeah, Blondin. He, he was a man, a um, trapeze artist, and he did some crazy stunts. And, and um, the story goes like this, that he was going to go over on a tightrope in Niagara Falls. Right? And, and the crowd said, we love you, Blondin. You can do anything. Do you know someone this morning that we love and who can do anything? His name's not Blondin. His name is Jesus. But the crowd said to Blondin, we love you. We believe that you can do anything. And he said, really? And they were puffing up his ego. And he said, well, do you believe that I can walk across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Yes, we believe he can, and he did. And then coming back, he said to the crowds that gathered on the other side, we love you, Blondin. We believe you can do anything. He said, really? He said, find me a wheelbarrow. So a wheelbarrow was found. He said, do you believe that I could put a man in this wheelbarrow and I could take him across this tightrope with a man in the wheelbarrow. And they said, we believe you could do it. To which Blondin allegedly replied, get in the wheelbarrow. Get in the wheelbarrow. Now, we say, don't we, as we come this morning, as we come before the Lord any day, we say that we, Lord, we love you. And we believe that you can do anything. And so the message this morning is this. Jesus says to you, he says to me, do you really believe that I can do anything? Get in the wheelbarrow. How many queued up to get in the wheelbarrow for Blondin to take across that tightrope across Niagara Falls? No one. Because it was all talk. You see, we can say we love Jesus and we believe that Jesus can do anything. But if we really believe he can do anything, if we really do trust him, then in a spiritual sense, we'll get in the wheelbarrow. If they really believed in Blondin, they would, someone would have, someone, at least someone, would have got into the wheelbarrow and said, I, I trust you. I trust you, Blondin, with my life. But no one was prepared to trust Blondin because who's Blondin? He's just a mere man. And sometimes we, we treat Jesus just as just a mere man. He's our rescuer. It's a big song, isn't it? It has been recently, a big song. With, um, with I think what they call themselves, a Rend Collection. Have you, have you seen them? They were in Cardiff recently. I couldn't go. I was preaching, but I would have gone. He's our rescuer. He, he's our saviour. He's our friend. He's our deliverer. Easy to sing it, isn't it? Isn't it? What's our response? Are we willing to trust him by faith? Get into the wheelbarrow. Now, this passage before us in Hebrews 12 talks about walking and living by faith. In chapter 11, we see that by faith, verse 3, 
we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Do you know, many people would, would, would have an issue with verse 3 of Hebrews 11 today. Because the majority of people that I bump into in the course of a week don't believe that God framed the universe. Don't believe in a creator. And I'll tell you why people don't believe in a creator. Because if there is a creator, which we know there is, because we've been worshipping him and we continue to worship him now, in listening to his word and, and listening to his voice, if, if there is a creator, then people are accountable to this creator. Sure they are. So if the devil can convince men and women and young people that there's no creator, you, you weren't creator, there's no creator, all these things just happened by coincidence and explosions and everything else, then man and, 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 and men and women, they have no accountability. I can live my life as I please because I'm not accountable to anyone. And that's one of the, the greatest lies that the devil gives to people. You're not created. You are, you are the result of coincidence and haphazardness. But the Bible says that we were created in the image of God. And that image, after the fall, is distorted by sin. But we were built, we were made, we were designed, we were created to be in a relationship with God. Before the fall, what sort of relationship did Adam and Eve enjoy with God, their creator? It was one of intimacy. The pre-incarnate Jesus walking with them in the garden. They heard him coming, the Bible says. Do you know how they heard him come in? They heard the sound of the Lord God walking. A theophany. This is the pre-incarnate Christ. They heard the twig snap under the Lord's foot. Walking with Adam and Eve. And they exercised faith in their creator. They exercise faith in their Lord. They exercise faith in God. Did you know that? At the beginning of time. Because whatever God said to them, they accepted. And they lived out their lives in full view of that truth. That's what faith is. It's taking God at his word. Until one day, Someone else entered the scene. Someone else came in the form of a serpent. The same person that we've seen in the book of Job. That God allowed to bring affliction upon Job. It was the devil, the sa uh, Satan himself. And then he says this. Did God really say? Do you see the tactic of the devil? The tactic of the devil is this. Even in the very beginning, to Adam and Eve, he, ca he causes them to doubt what? Causes them to doubt God's word. And so that was the beginning, wasn't it? Because the, he planted that seed of doubt and then that seed of doubt led to transgression. And tran transgression led to fall. And the fall led to separation. Separation led to enmity. And enmity leads to death. And that's the story of redemption. God made Man in his image. Gave him all things to enjoy. Walked with him. Talked with him. Enjoyed fellowship. Koinonia with him. And then 
Temptation comes through the serpent, through Satan. What does he do? He causes them to doubt God's word. And that's the problem with our society today. People have been caused to doubt the validity and the authority and the truthfulness of God's word. And if you don't get your heads around Genesis chapters 1, 2 and 3, you won't understand the rest of the Bible. If you misinterpret those first three chapters of Scripture, you will misinterpret the whole of Scripture. If you misunderstand the beginning of the Bible, you will misunderstand the whole of Scripture. I was in a conference not so long ago, Evangelicals. And there was a man doing one of the seminars that I sat in, and he suggested that the Garden of Eden, the account that we have of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden with the Lord himself in the beginning of Scripture, in Genesis, he suggested that the Garden of Eden was a parable. You know what a parable is? A parable is an everyday story with a spiritual meaning. So he's saying, it's just a parable. It's, it's, it's a story that gives you a spiritual meaning. And so if you believe that, then the rest of Scripture makes no sense whatsoever. It's not a parable. It's not an everyday story with a spiritual meaning. It's reality. And so verse 3 of Hebrews 11 is, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. And I go to universities and I do ministry with students in universities. And they like to debate in the CU. They like to debate whether the, the evening and the morning in Genesis 1 is a literal 24-hour day. And so, because their argument is this. If it's not a 24-hour day, then, then actually the rest of the Genesis account is open to debate. Let me tell you, friends, nothing in Scripture is open for debate. It might be open for interpretation, a word there, hermeneutics, you know, that's a posh word for uh, an interpretation of Scripture. We, we might interpret some parts of Scripture which are, are prophetic or which could be symbolic. We might interpret that slightly differently because no one man apart from Christ knows the, the true interpretation of all things. We don't debate Scripture. By faith, we believe that God made the universe. God spoke it. God did it, it's written, I believe it. I think you need more faith to believe that everything came from a big bang. You look at the complexity of the human body. You look at the wonder of a, a newborn baby. You think about how, how we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You think about the complexity of the solar system. You can think the complexity of, of, of even the, the planet Earth that is on, the, on that tilt and it's spinning. You think of the complexity of nature. You think of the complexity of, of life itself. There's a creator. There's a designer. And there's a God who provided a way of salvation for fallen man. And where the first Adam got it wrong, the second Adam has come to make all things new. A better Adam, if you like. You've been with Mark looking at Hebrews. The theme of Hebrews is, is about better than, isn't it? Jesus is, is better than the prophet. He's better than the priest. He, 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 he's better than the old covenant. He is, he is the mediator of a better covenant, a new covenant, better than. And then we have examples of men and women who, who took God at his word. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark. Verse 7, Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham 
when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance. Obeyed, and what did he do? He went. That's faith. God spoke. He says, go to the land that I will show you. He obeyed and went. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was barren and able to become a father because he, was consi he considered him faithful who made the promise. All these people, verse 13, Hebrews 11, were still living by faith when they died. Will that be said of us? That Andy Pitt was still living by faith when he died. Will that be said of you? That you will be, people will know you to be a man or a woman, that when you die, they were still living by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. Don't be conned by what you see. Don't be conned by what you feel or what you can touch. We wholly stand on Jesus' name. We wholly stand on his word. By faith, when Abraham test, when God tested Abraham, he offered Isaac as a sacrifice. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, verse 22, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as to dry land. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, um, because she, was, she welcomed the spies, was not killed. And then verse 32, I love this verse. What more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith, through faith, conquered what do they conquer? Kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in caves and holes in the ground. These were all, listen to this, these were all commended for their, what? Faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us they would be made perfect. Therefore, in the light of these things, since we are surrounded by what? A great cloud of witnesses. Now, some commentators try to... to bring us to uh, the scene or the imagery of a, an athletic stadium. And, and, you know, we now enter the race. And all these previous godly men and women are sat in the stands cheering us on. It doesn't mean that at all. Let me tell you, people in heaven cannot see us here on earth. They're not in heaven going, go on Andy, go for it son! When I'm, at, when I'm in the rugby club Thursday night preaching the gospel, they're not in heaven going, go on, I, go on, my son, go on, give it to them, sock it to them. They're not cheering us on. Or in the pamper day, oh, go on, put that, put that red lipstick on, go on, put it, put it bright, put it on, lashings of it. <laughs> they're, not, they're not cheering us on, are they? They are examples of men and women who live by faith. Ordinary men and women like you and me. We're any ordinary people, aren't we? I mean, listen. Most of us will, will live for however many years and die. And, and very soon after we die, they'll say, oh, he was nice. She was nice. But we're soon forgotten. Not by the Lord, but by everyone else. We're any ordinary people. But this verse reminds me... That God in times past, and not just in Bible times, but in church history, has taken ordinary men and women 
And because they were willing to just live their lives simply by faith, he's taken a hold of them and he's taken and used them. And they've done, an, an, in, they've done outrageous things. They've done enormous things. They've done exciting things. And to them, all they're doing is living a simple life. Hearing what God says. Responding to his word. Responding to his voice. Living by faith. Lord, I don't understand, but I trust you. Lord, I'm hurting, but I trust you. Lord, I'm down in the dumps, but I trust you. Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm on the mountaintop, but I'm still trusting you. Therefore, since we are surrounded by men and women who have been witnesses to God's prevailing grace, they lived by faith. But we need to throw off everything that will hinder or prevent us to run the race of faith with perseverance. That race that's been marked out for us. I was a sprinter. 100 metres. 4 by 100 relay. Let me tell you how quickly my personal best was. I'm not bragging. But when I watch the Olympic Games, I watch the women who compete in the final of the 100 metres. And my personal best is alongside theirs. Now, of course, men run a bit quicker than women, isn't it? Particularly when we do done something wrong. <laughs> we outrun our wives. I could run like the wind. But the Christian life is not about a sprint. 100 metres, I'd run the first bend or the, or, or, or the last bend. So short, you see, no centre of gravity. I'd whiz round the curb. But don't ask me to, to, to run 400 metres. That's one lap of the athletic track. I didn't have the stamina. Sometimes at school, we used to do cross-country. Who did cross-country? I had to really think carefully about this. Even as a fit, young 15-year-old, I used to think, how can I get around this? So what we used to do, as the course took us past my dad's house, I'd be in at the back, and I'd slope off for a cup of tea and a chocolate hobnob. And then I'd be there, and my dad would say, how long are you here for? I said, well, it'd be about an hour. They'll be coming back then, right? And as they come back, I'd join the thing. And then right at the end, say there's 120 boys racing, and I'm, I'm about 120th, because I've just joined the race again. Cheating of us. And then when we got to the last, say, 100 meters, I could go from 120th to about 89th because I could run like the wind. I'd be suitably refreshed. Tea and hobnobs. <laughs> and sometimes, as Christians, we behave like that. We try to look for the shortcut. You know, because what we want as Christians, we want all the blessing. We don't want the trials. We certainly don't want temptations. We want, we want the blessings. We want to live our lives on the mountaintop experience. We want to be like Peter, James and John, who are on the, on the Mount of Transfiguration, saying, oh, let's build shelters here that we might stay here forever and enjoy this moment. Friends, that's not reality. It was reality for them for a, for a fleeting moment. Let me tell you this. 99% of life is monotonous and mundane. 99% of life is monotonous and mundane. You don't hear preachers say that, do you? Come to Jesus and the life is brilliant. I'm telling you, most of life is monotonous and mundane. And we can't cut corners. And the Christian life and walking by faith is not it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. 
Anyone here? Come on, you look quite fit, some of you. Have you ever run a marathon? I have a friend of mine who's a pastor, and he, and he, uh, he runs marathons. He's done like 30 of them. 30? I'm not even sure I could cycle the distance of a marathon if I run it. But this is the thing. When you train f- to run a marathon, do you know how, how, how far is a marathon? 27 miles, is it? 26? Something like that, isn't it? Yeah, it's quite a way. When you train for a marathon, you don't, you don't run in training the whole length. Did you know that? He told me this, and he's the expert. The furthest in training for a marathon you ever run is 18 miles. 18 miles? So I said, so what then happens when you... When you're in the race, and you, one mile, eight miles, 12 miles, 15 miles, 16, 17, 18, what happens then? Because you're now going into unknown territory. You've never run that, so that, that distance before. What happens then? It's about fixing your eyes on the winning post. And surely, as Christians, we go through periods of our lives that, we've, that we're in uncharted territory. That we face circumstances that we've never faced before. As someone once said, there's not a rehearsal for life. This is it. And so for the Christian, well, no, let's, what, about, what about our unbelieving friends? How do they cope with the unforeseen and, and the uncharted territory of life? How do they survive? Do you know what they do? Would you like me to show you what they do? Touch wood. <laughs> touch wood. And they're holding on, touch wood. Oh, what, 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 hang on a minute. What value is there in wood? Solid enough? How, how on earth is that going to sustain you through a bereavement? How on earth is that going to help you when you're stood by an open grave? How is that going to help you when you've had the results back of your scan and they're not favourable? Touch wood? But they just just don't do that, do they? Do you know what else they do? Shall I show you? (laughs) Everything's crossed. Have you seen them? Touch wood. <laughs> Should I tell what else they do? They take the daily mirror. <laughs> they do. Or the sun. Is there a daily star? Maybe. Maybe. A wise answer. (laughs) They take the daily tabloid and they turn to page 58. Well, it was 58 when I last looked. Little joke there. Ah! July. We're July today, isn't it? Hurrah! Birthday month for Andy. I won't tell you which day. Just got a one in. Think about it. That's not today. <laughs> that limits it, doesn't it? Ah! I'm. Do you know what I am? 
I'm a Leo. Leo, Leo, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, today you're going to meet someone wise. I'm looking at my wife. <laughs> well, that's wrong already, isn't it? And people believe in this. It's gobbledygook. It's complete and utter nonsense. Do you know what else they believe in? It's a four-letter word. Fate. F-A-T-E. Fate. Not to be confused with fate, F-E-T-E. Because we like fates, but not fate. K sera sera. <laughs> That's the theology of the unbeliever. Whatever will be, will be. K sera sera. What does the scripture say? By faith, these were commended. They were known for living by faith when they died. The race is not a, not a sprint, it's a marathon. And we can train and prepare ourselves all we like. There will come a moment in your relationship with the Lord when you are wholly dependent on him. He is the only one who will hold you fast. He is the only one who will, who will be like an anchor for your soul. He is the one who will keep you by his grace. He is the one who will sustain you. He is the one who holds you in the palm of his hand. He is the one who has written in the Lamb's book of life your name. And nothing, not even eternity, can erase it. There's no tipex in heaven. You'd be pleased to know. By faith... That's how we're saved. That's how the ancients were saved. That's how we are saved, by faith. Not in wood, not in fatalism, but by faith in a person, the living Lord Jesus Christ. He lived, he died, he rose again. He ever lives, Hebrews, he ever lives to make intercession for his people. So if we want to run this race, what are we going to do? We've got to let go of the sin that so easily entangles. Raise a hand with me, please. Some of you have open hands. Some of you have closed hands. An open hand is a hand that reminds me of God. His hand is always open to you. A closed hand reminds me of self. What I have, I keep for me. If your arms are aching, you can let them down there. I tell this story on, on kids' clubs when I do holiday bar clubs. There was the hunter in the jungle. And he wanted to catch the monkey. But the monkey was bright. The monkey was clever. The monkey was full of agility. He would swing through the trees. He'd see the old hunter. He'd say, you're never going to catch me. He was too quick. Too decisive. But one day, the old hunter had a plan. Or as Baldrick might say, a cunning plan. If you know that, then you're old like me. And he placed a jar of nuts, let's call them peanuts, in the middle of the jungle. And he removed the lid and left this jar of peanuts hid in the bushes, lay in wait for Mr. Monkey. Sure enough, Mr. Monkey swings through the trees. And he spots something. It's glistening, it's dazzling in the sunlight. What is that? It's the glass jar, isn't it? Which the peanuts are in. So he comes down and he inspects, he, he holds this jar. And then he smells the peanuts. 
Mmm. Mmm. And then he realized that he could put his little hand in. And he could touch. Not only smell, but he could touch the peanuts. And then he did this. And this is what we do with sin. He takes a hold, a fistful of nuts. But there's a problem. He wants the nuts more than anything. He wants to enjoy the nuts, but there's a problem. As long as he holds on to those nuts, he can't get his fist or his hand out of the jar. And he's there, trying to, holding on to the nuts, and he's trying to pull his fist out of the jar, but he can't. And he's so engrossed that he's there for, for many minutes. And whilst he's so engrossed with these peanuts and he's refusing to let go, the old hunter comes along, <laughs> throws a net over the monkey and captures him. And with the children, I stop there. I'll leave the rest to your imagination. This passage says, let us throw off, let us let go of the sin that hinders and entangles. And do you know what we're like? We're like the monkey in the story. That's not, we've got a hold of something that we want, that we want, we enjoy. It looks nice, it smells nice, I want this. And all the monkey had to do was to let go of the nuts and he would be free. But because he refused to let go, he eventually died. Let go of the sin in your life this morning. Because you see, you'll never run this race and you'll never complete this race if you're running, holding on to the things that easily entangle and hinder you. And Jesus said this, it's not how we start, it's how we finish. Many will start. Many will say, Lord, Lord, we performed miracles in your name. We prophesied in your name. We did many amazing things in your name. To which Jesus, scriptures teach, will reply, away from me, I never knew you. He who endures, he who perseveres to the end, Jesus says, will be saved. And so there's, there's, there's a challenge here, isn't it? That we need to let go of the sin that hinders, that so easily entangles. Let us run. Let us run with perseverance. Let's run with endurance. Just as Jesus endured, verse 3 of Hebrews 12, just as Jesus endured such opposition from sinful men, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne. Why did he sit down at the right hand of the throne? Because his work that he'd come to do had been completed. On the cross, he cried, it is finished. Tetelestai, that's, what, that's the word. Tetelestai, it's finished. My work has been done. I have fulfilled the will of my Father who sent me. Why did he come? I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so we need this morning, in closing, to consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men. And why do we need to consider him who endured? Because this same Jesus, Lord and King, is able to help us persevere. He's able to help us endure. He's able to keep us by his grace, 
he will lead us and guide us safely home. But what are we going to do? His grace sustains us. What are we going to do? We've got to let go. Let go of the sin that so easily. Otherwise, you will, look at the warning, otherwise you will, end of verse 3, you will grow weary and lose heart. So consider him so that you do not become weary, that you do not lose heart. Are you weary this morning as a Christian? Are you losing heart as a Christian this morning? Now let me help you. In the moments, in the 40 odd years that I've been a believer, let me tell you, when I look back now, those moments when I've, as a Christian, become weary and I've lost heart, it's because of this. It's because I've not been letting go of the sin in my life that so easily entangles and hinders. Now, because we are frail human beings, we, we like to categorize sin, don't we? That's what the world does. I'm not as good as him, but I'm better than her. That's the world's view of, of sin. They categorize sin. Remember Fred and Rosie West? Gloucester. Murdered all those children. Most of those children they murdered were in my mother taught. They were in her school in Gloucester. She knew the family. And after it all became public, they looked through their records. And social services and the police and the authorities came and looked at the school records. And this is what they said of Rosie and Fred West. Delightful, caring couple who cared deeply for their children. No one knew. No one knew what went on in the basement of Cromwell Street in Gloucester. But God knew. And we could roll up on a Sunday morning and Sunday evening and even come to the prayer meeting. And no one really knows what's going on in the basement of our hearts. But God does. And in my life, when I've looked back, in those moments when I've become when I've grown weary and I've tended to lose heart, it's because of this. An unwillingness to let go. Let's not categorize sin. Let's recognize sin for what it is. Someone disappointed you this week? Forgive them. Because if you fail to forgive them, that's sin. Maybe, you, maybe you've disappointed someone this week, then you ought to be forgiven. Spoken harshly to someone. I did it this morning with my wife. And I had to apologize. I can't preach until I've put things right. I can't function until I put things right. I walk by faith, not by sight. If I'm out of, if I'm out of fellowship with my wife, I'm out of fellowship with the Lord. I'm out of fellowship with his people. Put it right. Otherwise, we become the monkey that won't let go. I hold on to my rights. I hold on to my privileges. I hold on to my, my position. I hold on to whatever. Let go. And people say to me, Pastor, I can't let go. And I say, wrong. You can because over the years, the Lord enabled me to let go. You can. There's something within me when I hear the word can't. You can. Let's let go. I had a sermon prepared for Job this morning. Prepared it in the week. Watched the football yesterday, feet up. And then last night, this message comes to me. I said, Lord, Brother Mark's dealing with Hebrews? And he said, yeah, but he's in chapter four. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't tell him that, because he, he's a bit sensitive, 11. 
let go. That's the message this morning. If you don't let go, then this sin is just destroying you. It's preventing you from running the race. It's preventing you from walking. It's preventing you from enjoying. Enjoying God and his, and his people and his blessings. Let go. Let go. Let go. Shall we sing? Let's come and sing.